Presento brevemente a David Zweikart, él es profesor de filosofía en la Universidad de Loyola en Chicago. Él eh, tiene un doctorado, hizo su doctorado en matemáticas y empezó dando clase como, como profe de matemáticas en la Universidad de Kentucky. Después de los, los 60 y una lectura profunda de, del Capital, decidió cambiar su carrera docente y dedicarse a la filosofía. No sé si él contará algo de esto más adelante, pero porque tengáis un breve, breve, una breve imagen de, de dónde viene. Y se ha dedicado, desde que, desde que cambió y se comenzó los estudios en, en filosofía, a desarrollar una alternativa al capitalismo, una alternativa socioeconómica que, que ha llamado democracia económica y sobre la que hay al menos un par de publicaciones en castellano, una suya y una recopilación reciente con el nombre democracia económica y, y que podéis encontrar en Icaria. Y más o menos esto, esto sería, os dejo con, con David. Uh, first of all, apologize for not being able to speak to you in Spanish. Uh, I have tried several times to learn, but without success. Uh, so, but I, it's, it's a great honor to be here and to be able to talk to such a large audience about a very crucial issue. Um, so I will, you know, read this, my talk in English, but you should have a copy that has been translated, so hopefully, you know, that will help. So, let me begin with a quote from the great German-Jewish Marxist philosopher Walter Benjamin. Marx says that revolutions are the locomotives of world history, but the situation may be quite different. Perhaps revolutions are not the train ride, but the human race grabbing for the emergency brake. That was Walter Benjamin in, in uh, 1940. Now, a footnote, as it happens, Benjamin committed suicide later that year in the coastal sound of Portbeu in Catalonia after the Franco government canceled all transit visas. He was trying to escape from Germany. He had worked it out. Uh, ordered the Spanish police to return such persons to France, which was then occupied by the Nazis. So instead of being executed by the Nazis, he decided to kill himself. That was a footnote. Okay, the debate, the current debate, eco-socialism, eco-capitalism. Ten years ago, Joel Covell published The Enemy of Nature. The book's, <clears throat> the book's subtitle states his thesis bluntly, the end of capitalism or the end of the world. Covell thinks we need a revolution, although he's fully cognizant of how remote that prospect seems. Okay. Growing numbers of people are beginning to realize that capitalism is the uncontrollable force driving our ecological crisis, only to become frozen in their tracks by the awesome implication of this insight. <coughs> Paul Hawken, Amory Lovins, and Hunter Lovins also thinks we need a revolution, but of a different sort than the one envisaged by Covell. Their book, Natural Capitalism, published in 1999, is subtitled, Creating the Next Industrial Revolution. Then President Bill Clinton is reported to have called it one of the five most important books in the world today. Hawken and Lovins agree with Covell that the current model of capitalism is problematic. To quote, capitalism as practiced is a financially profitable, non-sustainable aberration in human development. But they don't see the problem as residing in capitalism itself. They distinguish among four kinds of capital. Human capital, financial capital, manufactured capital, and natural capital. The problem with the current form of capitalism, they argued, is its radical mispricing of these factors. Current market prices woefully undervalue and often do not value at all the fourth factor, the natural resources and ecological systems that, quote, make life possible and worth living on this planet. Now, all economists recognize that market transactions can involve, quote, externalities, we call them, costs or benefits that are not paid for by the transacting parties. All agree that there's a role for governments to play in rectifying these defects. 
The standard remedies involve taxation for negative externalities and subsidies for positive externalities. Hawken and the Lovins argue that these remedies properly applied can work. The first step is to, el to eliminate the perverse incentives now in place. They document the massive subsidies that governments currently provide for ecologically destructive behavior. For example, agricultural subsidies that encourage soil degradation and wasteful use of water, subsidies to mining, oil, and forest industries, etc. The second step, impose resource and pollution taxes so that prices reflect the, two co the true costs of natural capital. The point is to allow more sustainable energy technologies and more energy efficient processes to compete fairly with the destructive practices of industrial capitalism. We might even want to go further and subsidize, at least initially, the technologies that reduce the negative Im environmental impacts of our production and consumption choices. If we take these steps, Hawken and Lovins envisage a bright future. Imagine for a moment a world where cities have become peaceful and serene because cars and buses are whisper quiet, vehicles exhaust only water vapor, and parks and greenways have replaced unneeded freeways. OPEC has ceased to function because the price of oil has fallen to $5 a barrel, but there are few buyers because it, cheaper and better ways now exist to get the services people once turned to oil to provide. Living standards for all people have dramatically improved, particularly for the poor and those in developing countries. Involuntary unemployment no longer exists, and income taxes have been largely eliminated. Houses, even low-income housing units, can pay part of their mortgage costs by the energy they produce. Such a future will come about if we harness the creative energies of capitalism and let the markets do their work. In essence, there are two fundamental, fundamental differences between the eco-socialism of Covell and the eco-capitalism of Hawk and Lovins. First of all, Covell is deeply distrustful of the profit motive. He does not think greed can serve the good. Hawk and Lovins think that profit motive can be harnessed so as to provide uh, incentives to develop sustainable sources of energy and to eliminate the energy waste so rampant today. Secondly, Covell is convinced that grow or die is an imperative of capitalism that renders sustainable capitalism impossible. Hawken and Lovins do not confront this argument directly, but appear to believe either A, capitalism is compatible with steady state non-growing economy, or B, an economy can grow indefinitely without consuming more energy and natural resources than it can sustainably reproduce. So let's examine the grow or die issue first. Anti-capitalist ecologists often say this. In Covell's words, capital must expand without end in order to exist. But is this true? It would seem not to be Capitalism has survived prolonged depressions. The Great Depression beginning in 1929 lasted a decade. It survived the crash of 2008. Periods of stagnation have been even more common. Witness Japan from the 1980s to the present. Japan's growth rate has only been 1.5% per year from 1980 till now. To be sure, capitalism incentivizes growth, but thwarted growth does not appear to lead to death. We can point to many counterexamples. Nevertheless, Covell has a point. He may have overstated the case, but from an ecological point of view, there's something at least prima facie crazy about capitalism. An ecological worldview tends to emphasize harmony, sustainability, moderation, rather like that of the ancient Greeks, for whom a constant striving for more is regarded as a mark of an unbalanced, deranged soul. Yet every capitalist enterprise is motivated to grow, to grow without limit. There's no mystery here. Expanding sales increases profits, making the owners richer. There's also a fear factor at work. 
Failure to take the steps necessary to grow the company puts the company at risk. In a capitalist economy, the big fish tend to eat the little fish. Capitalist market competition is cutthroat competition. There's a deeper structural issue that we must consider. It's true that capitalist firms are incentivized to grow, but wanting to grow doesn't guarantee growth. Obviously, many firms do not get what they want. Some firms remain small, many fail. The root problem with capitalism is not so much that the individual firms are incentivized to grow, although that is a contributing factor, but the economy as a whole must grow, not to survive perhaps, but to remain healthy. As we've noted, there have been significant periods in which capitalist economies have failed to grow but did not collapse. However, none of these periods, recession, stagnation, depression, have been happy times. Why must a capitalist economy grow to be healthy? The answer to this question is rather peculiar. <clears throat> a capitalist economy must grow to be healthy because capitalism re relies on private investors for investment funds. These investors are free to invest or not as they see fit. After all, it's their money. But this makes economic health dependent upon investor confidence, dependent on what the economist John Maynard Keynes called the animal spirits of investors. If investors are not promised, see, if they don't see promising investment opportunities, then they won't invest. And this investment must be in the real economy and not the financial sector. Investing in financial instruments, stocks, bonds, etc., is not, as Keynes points out, genuine investing, but it's a form of savings, which does nothing to increase either productivity or consumer demand. But if investors don't see opportunities to invest profitably in the real economy, they won't. But in this case, their pessimism becomes self fulfilling. Lack of such investment translates into layoffs, first in the capital good industries, and then since layoffs provoke decline in consumer demand in other sectors as well. When people lose their jobs, they can't buy as much. Aggregate demand drops further. Unless counteracted by a surge of new investment, the economy slides into recession. And as we all know from both historical record and present experience, a slumping economy is not just bad for the capitalist investors, it's bad for almost everyone. Unemployment rises, which adds to the stress even on almost all workers, even those who do retain their jobs. Government revenues fall, adding pressure to cut government employment and government services. Indeed, public funds for environmental programs are jeopardized, as mainstream economists are quick to point out, uh, as impatient as they are with the anti-growth ecologists. Growth is necessary, they insist, to give us the means to clean up the messes we have made. So, a healthy capitalism requires a steady expansion of consumption. If sales decline, investors lose confidence, as well they should. Of course, environmentalists often point out that GDP growth is not an indicator of human happiness or human development, which is true, but these critics seem not to notice that GDP growth is precisely what's important to investors, who must at all costs be kept happy. So, quick summary, uh, slide seven. A healthy <coughs> capitalism requires growth. Let me just look at my own paper for this. Here it is. Uh, every year, an enormous quantity of goods are produced to be sold at a profit. If they're sold, most of the profits will be reinvested, so as to produce even more goods. If, if existing goods can't be readily sold, investors lose confidence. Production is cut back, workers are laid off, demand declines, recession. Recessions hurt everybody, so business, labor, government are all oriented to grow, whether or not growth makes people happier or enhances the quality of life. Now, the problem is not simply growth. A healthy capitalism depends not simply on ever-increasing consumption, but on a steady rate of growth. When growth rates decline, investors pull back. 
But a steady rate of growth so essential to a healthy capitalism implies exponential growth. And exponential growth to anyone with the mathematical sensibilities is deeply disturbing. Remember, if you've heard of it before, the rule of 72. To calculate how long it takes for something growing at a constant rate r to double in size, you divide 72 by r. If an economy grows at 3% a year, for example, the US average growth rate during the 20th century, consumption doubles every 24 years. 72 divided by 3 is 24. But this translates in the course of a century to a 16-fold increase. GDP will double in 24 years, then quadruple after 48 years, then eight-fold increase by 72 uh, years, and then 16 times uh, by 2096. Slide on that. The mathematics of capitalism. Capitalist insanity. The rule of 72, a quantity growing at X percent per year will double every 72 divided by R. So at 3%, the US GDP in 2000 was $10 trillion, okay? That means by 2024, it'll be 20 trillion, and then by 2048, it'll be 40 trillion, and then by 2072, it'll be 80 trillion, and then by the century's end, 160 trillion. Now, I know it's hard, I know China, uh, if uh, China is 10% growth per year, I don't have a slide for this one, but uh, which it achieved between 1990 and 2010, it was growing at 10% a year. If you do the math on this one, China would be consuming not 16 times more by centuries in, but 16,000 times more. I know it's hard to believe, but do the math. As Kenneth Boulding himself, an economist, has noted, only a madman or an economist thinks exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world. And I would add capitalist to that list. Now, there's an important rejoinder to this argument that we must consider. Growth need not add to resource depletion or pollution. GDP is a quantitative figure that doesn't pretend to correlate with general well-being. An oil spill that puts lots of people to work cleaning it up enhances GDP. When harried couples eat out more often, no longer having time to cook at home, GDP goes up. By the same logic, if unemployed people are put to work planting trees, GDP goes up. If there's a shift from capital-intensive factory farming to labor-intensive organic farming and the market value of the latter exceeds the market value of the former, GDP goes up. So growth, the right kind of growth, need not stress the environment. Growth need not add to resource depletion or pollution. Now from the perspective of strict logic, this is true. A sustainable science, a sustainable capitalism is possible. But it should be noted that we're no longer talking about economic science anymore, we're talking about faith. The economist's faith that exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world, that new technologies will save us, allowing consumption to go up and up and up forever. Now is this a rational faith? And here one is reminded of Pascal's wager regarding the existence of God. Some of you may know this if you've taken a philosophy class. Uh, Pascal, Blaise Pascal was a you know, 17th century philosopher mathematician. His argument is simple. Does God exist? Maybe yes, maybe no. What is the rational response to this hugely important, highly contentious question? Pascal's answer, do what any good mathematician would do. Calculate expected gains and expected losses. Consider, he says, if you bet yes that God exists and are right, and live a life accordingly, the rewards are infinite and eternity in heaven. If you bet yes that God exists and are wrong, how much will you lose? Very little. 
If anything, the time you've spent going to church and praying and maybe a little additional guilt from time to time. What if you bet no, that God doesn't exist in our right? How much will you gain? Again, not much. But what if you bet no and there is no God and are wrong? Well, says Pascal, an eternity of hellfire. Open and shut case. To risk, the, risk that horror for an eternity uh, when gains for being right are minimal is not a risk a rational being would take. Now, of course, there is a preposition here, an assumption here that, you know, if you don't believe in God, you will go to hell. That, you know, is debatable. But uh, we've got an ecological counterpart to this. Can exponential growth go on forever or at least for a long, long time in our finite world? If we decide to stick with capitalism, betting that it can, well, here's the Pascalian point. We can be almost certain that this growth won't make us happier. At least not those of us who are doing most of the consuming and polluting right now. There's a large literature on happiness. We know that increased consumption, once we get beyond a certain point, does not translate into increased happiness. Environmental author and activist Bill McKibben cites some of the evidence. Compared to 1950, the average American family now owns twice as many cars, uses 21 times as much plastic, travels 25 times farther by air. Gross domestic product has tripled since 1950 in the United States. We obviously eat more calories, and yet the satisfaction meter seems not to have budged. More Americans say their marriages are unhappy, their jobs are hideous, they don't like the places where they live. The number who, all things considered, say they are very happy with their lives has slid steadily during that period. In the United Kingdom, per capita gross domestic product grew 66% between 1973 and 2001, yet people's satisfaction with their lives changed not a bit. Nor did it budge in Japan in the post-war years, which saw a five-fold increase. Thus, if we put our trust in regulated capitalism and it delivers the technological innovation and wise governance to keep the economy growing steadily without inducing environmental havoc, the expected gains are slight at best in terms of human happiness. But if we place our faith in capitalism and are, are wrong, not hellfire, but massive planetary misery, perhaps even the extinction of our species. Now, there's a deep assumption built into the ecological Pascalian argument I've just presented. Pascal's wager is not just about belief, it's about how to live one's life. Our Pascalian wager is also about living collectively, about living under capitalism. But if there is no viable economic alternative to capitalism, then what? We might as well assume that growth can go on forever in a finite world. A belief that allows for some hope is surely better than one that offers none at all. So, fundamental question, is there an alternative? Does there exist an economic alternative to capitalism that is economically viable, not dependent on growth for its stability, yet conducive to the entrepreneurial innovation we will need to get through the current crisis. Now, it may come as a surprise to most people, but the answer is clearly yes. In my view, theoretical analysis backed by empirical evidence strongly supports the thesis that a truly democratic economy could satisfy the above criteria. Let me sketch the basic institutions of a democratic economy. We will retain the competitive markets. Here I disagree with Covell's assumption that all markets are pernicious. A capitalist free market, now capitalist free market economy actually consists of three different kinds of markets. Markets for goods and services, whoops, yeah, you got it. Uh, labor markets and capital markets. I propose that we keep the capitalist markets for goods and services, but extend democracy to both the workplace and the financial system. 
That is to say, let's keep markets for goods and services, but replace those labor markets and capital markets with democratic alternatives. Let's call our new system economic democracy. Now, needless to say, what I'm offering is a simplified model. In practice, the democratic economy would be more complex, but the model captures the basic structure of the new order. So you can fill in capitals. Okay, the basic model. Uh, market for goods and services, which will, let's see, let's find what I've got here. Uh, um, which is essentially the same as under capitalism. Workplace democracy, which replaces the capitalist institution of wage labor, and democratic control of investment, uh, which replaces the capitalist financial markets. Now let me talk about this. Fill in some details. Democratized labor. Imagine an economy as technologically developed as our own in which most workplaces are truly democratic. Suppose businesses are regarded as communities, not legal entities that can be bought and sold. Management is appointed by a worker council, which is elected by the workforce, one person, one vote. These enterprises compete with one another in reasonably regulated markets. Such enterprises can be expected to be efficient. Workers do not receive wages, but a specified share of the firm's profit. They don't have to be equal share, but everybody gets a share of the profit. Uh, so everyone is motivated not only to work efficiently, but to monitor co-workers, thus reducing the, the need for a lot of external supervision. It should not be surprising that empirical studies comparing democratic firms with comparable capitalist firms consistently find the former performing at least as well as the latter and often better. But here's something interesting. Although democratic and capitalist firms are both motivated to produce efficiently and to satisfy consumer desires, they are strikingly different in their orientation to growth. Under conditions of constant return to scale, if you can just expand everything, everything goes up, uh, capitalist firms expand, whereas democratic firms do not. For a capitalist firm aims to maximize total profits, whereas democratic firms aim roughly at maximizing profit per worker. That is to say, the owner of a capitalist firm, if demand is sufficient, can double their profits by doubling the size of their operation. But if a democratic firm doubles its size, sure, it doubles its profit, but it doubles the size of the workforce that you have to divide the profit among. So the income per worker is unchanged. Let me point out that nonprofit organizations exhibit the same sustainable dynamic. In Chicago, you know, I teach at Loyola University, a fairly large Catholic university. Also in Chicago is DePaul University, a comparable Catholic university with whom we compete for students. Now, if DePaul introduces a program which students find attractive, we will likely do the same. I mean, we don't want to lose enrollment to our crosstown competitors. But notice, we have no interest whatsoever in driving DePaul out of business. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to double the size of our university, double the size of all of our departments? That would just diminish the influence that individuals have in, in, in governance uh, without any financial gain at all. This is an enormously important structural difference with implications that go well beyond environmental concern. But let me focus on two that bear on the question at hand. One implication, democratic competition is less intense than capitalist competition. competition. Firms compete for market share, but not market dominance. Hence, democratic firms, when, when competing with other democratic firms, do not face the same grow or die imperative that capitalist firms face. Workers cannot increase their income by expanding the size of their enterprise unless economies of scale are significant. At the same time, they don't have to worry about being driven out of business by more innovative or efficient rivals. They have time to adjust, to copy or compensate for whatever successful innovation their rivals have introduced. 
And notice, since competition among democratic firms is less intense than under capitalism, monopolies are less likely to form. As I noticed er, noted earlier, under capitalism, the big fish gobble up the little fish. Under economic democracy, the fish swim around together, learning from one another. Or to use another metaphor, democratic firms are like healthy cells. They reach a certain size, then they stabilize. Capitalist firms are cancer cells. They grow exponentially. A second implication. When innovation brings about a productivity gains, workers can choose leisure over increased consumption. They can increase production and, if demand remains strong, make more money, or they can produce what they did before but work fewer hours per week, or take longer vacations. This latter option is unavailable in a capitalist firm. Owners do not increase their profits by allowing their workforce to work less. To the contrary, increased productivity often leads to workers working, workers working more or harder than before since productivity enhancing innovation often puts their jobs at risk. A footnote here, a 2008 Harvard Business School survey of thousands of professionals, this is the United States, found 94% worked 50 or more hours per week and almost half worked more than 65. In finance, it's even worse. Junior investment bank analysts at Goldman Sachs had to be told not to work on average more than 75 hours a week. A nine-year study of two big investment banks showed people spent up to 120 hours a week on the job and began to break down after four years, depression, anxiety, immune system problems, suffering a decline in creativity and just been 120 hours. If you do the math, 24 times five is 120. So this is what, you know, the pressure people are under when there's lots of innovation and it doesn't translate into, le into leisure. If ever increasing consumption is a serious environmental threat and if market competition is essential to an efficient functioning economy, then it's vital to have a system that offers non-consumption incentives to businesses. Increased leisure is readily available, a readily available option to a democratic firm, but not in a capitalist firm. Of course, this choice is not guaranteed by democratic structure and environmental consciousness, or at least a consciousness as to what actually makes people happier matters, but such a consciousness does not conflict with the structural imperatives of a democratic economy as it does with the imperatives of a healthy capitalism. Okay, that's democratizing work. Democratizing capital, what does that mean? Well, capitalist financial institutions, for all their ever-increasing mind-boggling complexity, stocks, bonds, futures, mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, structured investment vehicles, etc., are all supposed to exist to serve one fundamental purpose, to mobilize private savings of individuals and make them available to individuals wanting to uh, start new businesses or to existing enterprises wanting to expand production upgrade their technologies, introduce new products, etc. Unfortunately, very little of what contemporary financial institutions and instruments accomplish have anything to do with this fundamental purpose. The fact of the matter is they are counterproductive. We can discuss this more later if you'd like. Um, what we need is an intelligible, transparent, public banking system. I mean, I would argue that most financial markets now are counterproductive uh, and need to be replaced, gotten rid of. We don't need Wall Street anymore. Suppose we decide not to rely on the private savings of private individuals for investment. Suppose we don't want to be hostage to the animal spirits of investors. A substitute mechanism for generating investment capital is readily available. Taxation. For technical reasons, the most appropriate tax is a flat rate tax on the value of each enterprise's capital assets, basically a flat rate business tax. In essence, this tax replaces that portion of an enterprise's profit that is paid out as dividends to shareholders in a capitalist economy. 
The tax can be thought of as a leasing fee, the charge workers in a democratic enterprise pay for the capital assets they employ. Now these tax revenues will fund the bulk of new investment in our society. How will they be allocated? Well, there are various possibilities. The most transparent and in many ways the fairest is to set aside a portion for public projects that are national in scope and then to allocate the remainder to regions and communities on a per capita basis. That is to say, if a region contains X percent of the population, it gets X percent of the new investment funds each and every year. These funds are distributed to regional, local investment banks, public banks, that then loan them out to individuals seeking funds to start up new businesses and to existing businesses wanting to upgrade or expand operations. Loan applications are judged in terms of projected profitability, you don't want to waste funds, employment creation, and environmental enhancement. Since loan officers are public officials and since all records are open to public inspection, the task of monitoring performance should not be unduly different, difficult. So this democratization of investment has two consequences of major importance to environmental sustainability. First and most important, the health of the economy no longer depends on economic growth since investment no longer depends on keeping investors happy. Every year, funds flow into each region. If there's insufficient demand for these funds, they can be returned to taxpayers, thus keeping the up effective demand. If low demand persists, the capital assets tax can be cut. There's no longer any danger of investors deciding not to invest. Nor is there any danger of investment funds moving abroad. The investment funds are tax generated. They all stay in the country. Needless to say, existing enterprises won't move abroad either. Workers aren't going to vote to move their operations to other countries or even to other locations within their own country. A democratic economy is far more stable than a capitalist economy. Second important consequence, with investments under democratic control, long-term economic planning is possible. Something absolutely necessary in dealing with climate change. The economist James Galbraith has correctly noted markets are good for, for many things, but they have two defects. The poor don't count, and the future doesn't count. Uh, this has always been a problem for capitalism, but in this modern era of high-speed trading, it's become existentially acute. Investment decisions, in fact, shape the future of everyone and hence need to be brought under democratic control. It should be noted that investment mechanism I'm proposing is not one of excessive centralized planning. There will be public investing in projects that are national in scope, but much of the planning will be at regional and local levels. Recall, every year regions receive investment funds that can be used as they see fit. This means every year funds are available that can be used for, among other things, environmental experimentation, for construction of local mass transit or bike paths or community gardens for solar or wind or electric generation. Communities can learn from the experience of other communities, what works, what doesn't. Innovation is decentralized, local creativity enhanced. Natural capitalists might object at this point. They are eager to harness the capitalist entrepreneurial spirit to ecological ends. They like to point out the many opportunities that currently exist to make good money by doing good. More energy efficient manufacturing, green buildings, leasing rather than selling to promote recycling, efficient water management, organic agriculture, the list goes on. We don't want to lose the entrepreneurial initiative that can seize on such opportunities. They have a point. We could have an entrepreneurial capitalist sector in our democratic economy, which includes small businesses, but even quite large ones. Workplaces in this capitalist sector will not, of course, be democratic, but given the fact that these capitalist enterprises must compete with democratic enterprises for qualified workers, abuses are unlikely. Indeed, most capitalist firms will likely set up some participatory structures and profit sharing to keep morale high. 
Where would the private entrepreneurs get their capital? Well, they can get it from private sources if they want, but also from public banks. There's no reason to restrict the loans uh, of these public banks to democratic firms only. However, to prevent the entrepreneurial firms from becoming permanent eternal capitalist firms paying dividends forever to passive owners, a simple provision can be enacted. When, when the entrepreneur decides to leave the company, the enterprise must be sold to the state, which then turns it over to its workers to be run democratically. So capitalist entrepreneurs can actually serve a double function, suppliers of new ideas and creators of new democratic firms. So there's actually, we can have an honorable role for the entrepreneurial capitalist in our democratic economy. So in, in other words, we, the entrepreneurial spirit is what we need. We don't need private capitalists to supply capital and just make money from supplying money. There are two other institutions I advocate as part of what I call the extended model of economic democracy. Since they are less relevant to eco-capitalism, eco-socialism debate, I'll simply mention them here. I propose in addition to the institutions I've discussed that the government serve as the employer of last resort so that we can have a genuinely full employment economy uh, in which everyone has a genuine right to work and that we have a network of socialist savings and loan associations, essentially cooperative credit unions to handle household savings, consumer loans, credit cards, etc. See, our model sharply distinguishes institutions that supply investment funds to businesses from those that prov provide savings and credit investment, I mean, opportunities, instruments to consumers. So, to summarize briefly, we've got the basic model of economic democracy. Okay, uh, just again to summarize a little bit what I said about that. Next slide. Uh, workplace democracy, the workers elect a worker council that appoints upper management. Worker control of enterprise, the control of the enterprises democratically, one person, one vote. And workers' incomes are profit shares now, not wages. The ecological advantages of workplace democracy, Democratic firms grow to a certain size, then stabilize. Workers can choose more leisure over more consumption. Democratic control of, a, of a investment. First of all, there's a national investment fund. The national investment fund is generated not from private savings, but from a capital assets tax, a flat tax on the value assets of each business enterprise. Secondly, this fund is distributed to regions and to communities on a per capita basis. These funds are then allocated to a network of public investment banks that loan them out to existing enterprises or to individuals wanting to start new businesses. The ecological advantages of democratic control of investment, the health of the economy is not dependent on economic growth, and long-term investment planning is possible. Uh, then the extended model yeah, of economic democracy has uh, the entrepreneurial capitalist sector uh, and, you know, government as employer of last resort and the socialist savings and loan associations. So that's the basic model. Now, I've argued at length in a number of my books against capitalism, uh, the Spanish translation, Más allá del capitalismo, and my After Capitalism in 2011, that such an economic democracy as I've described would be economically viable and would be more ecologically sustainable than even the best case forms of capitalism. And it would be far more egalitarian than capitalism, far more democratic. It would also be a full employment economy without domestic poverty. Part three, fairly short but relevant, the Mondragon experiment. Although no national economy has yet restructured itself as a democratic economy, one of the most striking pieces of evidence that such an economy would be viable is to be found in the Basque region of your country, not far from the birthplace of St. Ignatius, who's the patron saint of my university. Uh, you may be familiar with it, certainly more so than your American counterparts, but let me say a few words and, you know, this 
may want to have a discussion about this part. Um, what I believe one day will be regarded as a world historic experiment began modestly enough. In 1943, a school for working class boys was established in the small town of Mondragon by Don Jose Maria Ares Mendirieta, a local priest who had barely escaped execution by the Franco forces during the Civil War. The Red Priest, as he was called in conservative circles, was a man with a large vision. Believing that God gives almost all people equal potential and dismayed that not a single working class youth from Mondragon had ever gone to attended university, Father Ars Mendrieta structured his school to promote technical expertise as well as social and spiritual values. Now 11 members of his first class of 20 went on to become professional engineers. In 1956, five of these 18 and 18 other workers set up at the priest's urging a cooperative factory making small cookers and stoves. In 1958, a second cooperative was established to make machine tools. In 1959, again at Ars Rieta's instigation, a cooperative bank to provide funding for other cooperatives. The initial experiment, a worker-owned factory making kerosene cookers, has developed since 1956 into a network of cooperative enterprises, including industrial cooperatives making home appliances, agricultural equipment, automobile components, machine tools, industrial robots, generators, numerical control systems, thermoplastics, medical equipment, home and office equipment, and much more. In 1991, 15 years after Ars Mendieta's death, these cooperatives always linked combined to form the Mondragon Corporación Co Cooperativa, MCC. MCC includes not only producer cooperatives and a bank, Caja Laboral, but also 15 research centers employing 2,000 full-time researchers, a social security service, a huge network of retail stores, Eraski, as you know, and several educational institutions, among them Mondragon University, widely regarded, I'm told, as one of the best technical universities in Spain. Today, MCC is the dominant economic power in the Basque region and is one of the largest corporations in Spain. All in all, MCC has a workforce of 73,000. Its industrial division created 3,000 new jobs during the past three years and now accounts for nearly 10% of all industrial jobs in the Basque region. In short, we have here a, co a corporation comparable in size and technological sophistication to large dynamic capitalist multinational that has an internal structure radically different from a capitalist corporation. In essence, MCC is a democratic federation of democratic cooperatives. Uh, any cooperative can leave at any time if they want. Of course, MCC is not a perfect model. Not all parts of the MCC are cooperatives. Most of the businesses set up outside the Basque region and all of the enterprises set up abroad are non-cooperative subsidiaries. MCC has grown rapidly since its inception, but not for reasons of profit maximization. One of its central missions is job creation, which it takes very seriously. Hence, its setting up of subsidiaries abroad is never at the expense of domestic workers. A principle of solidarity operates among member co-ops. As the Financial Times reported in 2009, those cooperatives hit hardest by the present crisis will be thrown a lifeline by associated companies that are weathering the tough economic conditions better. According to MCC statutes, solidarity funds are available to companies with problems if other measures fail, such as wage cuts, longer hours, and the transfer of workers to related, producer, uh, related producers if they, if they don't produce results. The principle was invoked more recently when Fagor, one of the first Mondragon cooperatives, was compelled to declare bankruptcy. Its principal products were refrigerators and washing machines in a market that collapsed by 50%, you know, when the Spanish economy, housing industry collapsed. But as a result of much effort, jobs were found for virtually all the worker owners who did not accept early retirement, although not all contract workers. 
So all in all, whatever its deviations from democratic perfection, MCC has demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that a worker-run enterprise is properly structured can be as efficient and dynamic as the largest and most efficient capitalist companies, while remaining far more egalitarian and democratic. So, conclusion. Thank you for your patience. I've argued that Covell, although too dismissive of market competition, is essentially right. We must move beyond capitalism if our species is to flourish. I've also argued that Hawkins, the Lovins, while proposing creative solutions to concrete problems, have not confronted two fundamental questions. Does a healthy capitalism require a steady rate of growth? And can exponential growth go on forever in a finite world? I've argued that the answer to the first question is yes, and that it's foolish to the point of irrationality to base one's hopes on a future, for the future on a positive answer to the latter. I've argued that there exists an alternative economic model that would not need to grow to remain healthy and would, in addition, be preferable to capitalism on many other grounds as well. I'm inclined to say that too many environmentalists aren't ecologically, uh, ecological enough. As ecological consciousness entails an awareness of the interconnectedness of things, the fact of the matter is the massive environmental problems we face are not unrelated to other social problems. Financial instability, national and global unemployment, national and global poverty, political dominance by an immensely wealthy capitalist class that genu undercuts genuinely democratic governance, an increasingly harried and increasingly insecure middle class that finds its opportunities for self, family, and community enhancing leisure time ever more restricted. We need to recognize that institutional reforms are possible that address simultaneously all of these problems, including the environmental ones, and that these reforms must take us beyond capitalism. Of course, I'm not the only one that believes this. All the watermelons do, this is the derisive terms that the anti-environmental right applies to those of us who are green on the inside, outside and red in the middle. Uh, but so does at least one Nobel laureate in economics. Amartya Sen, writing in the New York Review of Books about the 2009 European Conference on a New Capitalism, hosted by Nicolas Sarkozy and Tony Blair, asks, should we search for a new capitalism or for a new world that would take a different form? This question which is a rhetor rhetorical question, recalls a little noted passage in his 1999 treatise, Development as Freedom. The solutions to these problems, inequality, especially that of grinding poverty in a world of unprecedented prosperity, and of public goods, the goods, that is, goods people share together, such as the environment, will almost certainly call for institutions that take us beyond the capitalist market economy. I think we're in position now to see what those institutions might be. So thank you for your patience for a long paper.